Um, today, since we've done a lot of heavy lifting in terms of theoretical stuff, like, okay, the transport equation, uh, linear momentum, angular momentum. Today, I wanted to demonstrate the transport equation and use the homework as um, most of the examples, just so that we get some practice doing this. Because like I said, getting the kinematics correct for a problem and the problem setup is really important and helps you do the rest of the, the problem well, okay? Uh, so let's just go. So the homework problem, this is how I label things. So it's homework 1.1. 1 .1. This is the one that just has the, you're asked to look at a particle in 2D and calculate the inertial velocity um, going from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates using two methods, the direct substitution method. And then the second one would be what we're learning in this course on uh, using the transport equation, which involves having an, uh, knowing what the angular velocity vector is. So the setup for that, let me just give the little setup, the sketch. We got a particle P or just location P right, right now. We've got an origin O and we care about this vector, the location of P with respect to O or R, P, O. And I'll just call that R, right? For clarity's sake, we know it's location of P with respect to O. There are, there's the usual sort of inertial frame approach. So let's call those inertial directions, N1 and N2 where we would describe the location of the particle in terms of an x and y coordinate, so Cartesian coordinates. So x in the n, well, n1 direction plus y in the n2 direction. So I would say our coordinates, just so it's some clarity in what we're talking about, the coordinates are x and y. The uh, vector, these are the vectors, or usually they'll describe the frame, is the unit vectors, okay? Because there's an infinite number of ways we could write this vector. The vector kind of exists independent of which frame we choose to describe it in. And we, at least for this problem, are saying, well, let's Maybe there's some reason we want to use polar coordinates. Maybe it's a problem where we polar coordinates are a good approach, make more convenient looking equations of motion. So the polar coordinates are that there's a there's an ER, a unit vector pointing in the R vector direction. Um, and then there is E theta that's at 90 degrees counterclockwise rotation away from it, and they form frame. So we've got that um, B frame. And then there's a third vector, which we could either call E3, but it's the same as N3. It's some third vector that's coming out of the screen, hitting you. So that would be the polar coordinate frame. Now, what are the polar coordinates? So these are the polar vectors, ER and E theta. What are the polar coordinates? The polar coordinates are, there's R and then there's theta. And there's a relationship between X, Y. X, Y can be related to R and theta. So these are the polar coordinates and we could relate them to the Cartesian coordinates. And hopefully you've seen what that relationship is before. Otherwise you could just sort of derive it afresh given how we've defined theta. Theta is the angle of the ER vector from the N1 direction. 
So x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. So that's the relationship between the two coordinates. We could also uh, look at the inverse relationship. If I only had x and y, uh, how would I find out r and theta? And it involves, you know, arctangent or something. But let's just do it this way. The direct substitution method, if I wanted to find out what is the inertial velocity of the point P, so that is, in our other way of writing it, inertial derivative with respect to the inertial frame of R, P, O, would be, uh, we could just take the inertial derivative of this vector up here, so x dot n1, because the n1 direction doesn't change with respect to the inertial frame, since it defines the inertial frame, plus y dot n2. And then from there, we would write, what's the inertial acceleration, p, no, what's the inertial derivative of the inertial velocity? And it would be x double dot n1 plus y double dot n2. Okay. Now direct step substitution method is just, uh, you take these expressions up here, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and you take the time derivative of those and use the chain rule and everything and take two time derivatives of each and then just plug it back into here, okay? So what if we had x equals r cosine theta? Let's take a time derivative of that. So x dot is r dot cosine theta minus r theta dot sine theta. And then you would take another time derivative of that and get x double dot equals something. I'm not going to write out the whole something for you. Um, I guess just to say, what does it depend on? This is going to depend on probably r theta, r dot, theta dot, r double dot, and theta double dot. It might not be very pretty looking, um, but that's it. <clears throat> and same thing for y, y equals r sine theta, takes time derivatives and you'll get some stuff and eventually you'll get y double dot is some function of r theta, r dot, theta dot, r double dot, theta double dot. And then if you substitute in, so now we've got the inertial acceleration as these expressions, whatever they may be, whatever results from that taking time derivatives, but and then maybe this is where I'll put these things in red. We've still got this with respect to the inertial frame. We're writing it in inertial frame vectors and maybe we don't wanna do that. Maybe we wanna write it in the rotating frame vectors. So now what do we do? So this is still in the inertial frame unit vectors. So what we would do then is look at the relationship, which we derived in an uh, earlier class, how are N1 and N2 related to E R and E theta, and they were related by a two by two rotation matrix. So cosine theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. So then, right, this would tell you, you could write N1 equals cosine theta times ER 
minus sine theta, e theta, et cetera. Substitute in and then collect terms of what's in the ER direction and the E theta direction. So our goal is that, this is our goal. We want to write the inertial acceleration completely in terms of, I'll write it this way. It's the acceleration in the R direction times uh, in the ER direction plus the acceleration in the theta direction E theta. And so this is going to be tedious. Lots of substitutions and everything. What's AR going to be a function of? AR will be a function of probably R, maybe theta, R dot, theta dot, R double dot, theta double dot, etc. Tedious. Tedious. But hey, it's straightforward it's direct substitution it's a lot quicker if you use the transport equation approach okay so what's that transport equation approach well i, I think we already derived it um, but i would like you to try it again so the transport equation approach uh, approach is quicker. Cuts out all of this substitution and collecting terms and all that. So you should should try it. See how it works for you. What you end up getting is r double dot minus r theta dot squared e r plus r theta double dot plus two r theta dot r dot theta dot e theta and so we we already derived this either one or two lectures ago and it will give the same answer as direct substitution but it you just get to it quicker I would say it's obtained with fewer steps and less chance for mathematical error. Okay, so try that. Um, and then the last part of that problem, so I think this was like part B. Part C for that problem uh, was applying this to when I'm in class sometimes I bring a I'll bring like a a tube one of those it's like an empty um, paper towel roll and I'll put a marble in it and then I swing it around and it's kind of the same situation as what's sketched for that homework problem usually there's no there's no marble in it so nobody gets hurt but usually Right, so this is like a tube with a, a mass in it that's free to slide along the tube and the tube is turning. So hopefully you can imagine that due to the fact that the tube is turning, that's gonna make the marble or whatever wanna come out and then like shoot out in some direction. So how would we apply what we've got to this situation? Um, well, we we want to get the uh, uh, we've got this thing swinging around, and we're told it's swinging around with a, an angular rate of omega as a scalar. So we could use polar coordinates. In fact, that's what we're told to use. So we've got we've got this bar, and the frame that's attached to the bar is going to be like a body fixed frame and it's rotating, so it's a rotating frame. Here's the ER direction. And then we've got E theta direction. 
so we've we're we're basically defining that the theta direction is that way. It doesn't really matter exactly what theta is for this problem. All that matters is the the rate of change of theta. And so the rate of change of theta is the same as this angular velocity of the bar moving around um, from here to here. So if we say that this is uh, it's rotating about a point up there. Um, then we've got a, a rotating frame. We don't even necessarily even need to write the inertial frame, but you could if you want. There's some kind of inertial frame. As long as it's along this, we have the origin along this line, it's not really going to change the answer. So in the homework, it's like, well, here's the origin. And that's just supposed to kind of trick you. It doesn't really matter where it is. It could be here too. So let's just say this is N1. That's the real origin. Um, and then N2 doesn't really matter. N3. And N3 is the same as E3 because this axis, let me make this in a different color, green. This is the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame. The B frame being the body fixed frame on the tube and the I frame is an inertial frame. So what is this? This is omega in the E3 or N3 direction. The vertical direction is, is the same for both. Um, and we're saying that this is constant. Why is that important? Because then if you take a second derivative of theta, that equals zero. So that second derivative term drops out. And just based on the previous parts of the problem, you're just applying this to what's the speed of the, the marble at the point P. So the inertial acceleration of the marble written in terms of the tube fixed frame or the polar coordinate frame. This is R double dot minus R omega squared, right? Look up here, theta dot is omega. So we've got that in the ER direction plus two R dot omega dot in the E theta direction. So this is expressing the inertial acceleration of the mass M, but expressed in terms of the ER and E theta components as a function of R, R dot, R double dot, and omega. So it's a straightforward application of what you've done up above. All right, are there any, are there any questions about that problem? I mean, there's some steps that are left for you to do, which I think it's useful for you to go through, especially this first part of doing the tedious direct substitution so that you can appreciate the transport equation approach. And you need to suffer so that you can know um, approaches that are better. Is that well, just faster. omega in the E hat theta term in the answer? Is that just omega? You put omega dot. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. That's just omega. Okay, thank you. All right. So here everything, you know, all the rotation was basically everything was happening in 2D. So it made it um, at least simpler than the next two problems. The next two problems are where things get interesting. So homework 1.2, let me draw this situation. If I could find it. Doesn't look like it's here. Oh, this is week one. I don't want week one, I want week two, okay. There we go. Look at this crazy setup. So this is a 
it's like we've got a slider, a small ring at P, point P here. And it's on a bar that we call capital B. And that bar is universally pivoted to the slider Q, universally pivoted. Just that's like a ball and socket joint. That's that's all that that means. It means it's not a it's not a hinge or revolute joint. It can move in two different directions. It's got two degrees of freedom. Don't think of twist. Twist is irrelevant here. It can move in um, two degrees of freedom. And then that slider Q can go up and down. And we've got uh, we've labeled our inertial frame. Uh, you could treat this thing down here that's written as the E directions as the inertial frame. And you're asked for a few things. Um, well, you're first told that um, there are some coordinates here that can change in time. And you know maybe these were chosen for some reason that's useful for modeling. But your coordinates, so these would be, I might also call these variables, as in they can change in time, are h, so that's the height of the slider q above the inertial origin. Uh, there's r, which is you know how far is the ring p from q. There are some angular variables. There's theta, my theta is here. And then there's phi, so theta and phi. So th these things can these can change in time. Uh, sometimes we call these configuration variables. They are things that specify. Once you've specified them, they tell you where the point P is, where this, which would be you know important for the dynamics or something specifies where it is, plus they can change in time. So uh, to get equations of motion, you'll need to consider things like h, r, theta, phi, and also their time derivatives, as many as you will need. So like h dot, h double dot, and so on. So you're asked, it says in the Homer poem, it says use the vector differentiation formula, which is just, it's the same as the transport equation. Um, It's just my older way of describing it. So don't be confused. It's not anything different. It just is the transport equation. So use that to derive a few things. The first thing is the derivative with respect to the B frame of the vector QP. So what I'm writing is Q P, and maybe you've seen this notation in other books. This just means it's the vector from Q to P. So in the notation we've been adopting here, it's location of P with respect to Q. And the B frame, um, don't be thrown off by the fact that the, the directions are shown here as if like the end of this is the origin it's it's not if you uh if you want like the b frame has its origin at q and then it's a triad of unit vectors okay we just show it here because otherwise the diagram gets too complicated if we showed it right up next to the point q so that's the B frame. It's attached to the bar. B1 is along the bar. B2, this uh, is in the direction that phi increases. And then B3 completes the right-handed coordinate system. And it seems to be in the direction, or maybe it's in the opposite direction B3 is pointing in the opposite direction as theta increases. If you think of theta increasing, that means the bar would be moving down. So B3 is in direction 
opposite to theta increasing. So if you want, it's like a uh, spherical coordinate system, but we've written it as B1, B2, and B3, okay? So can we do this? What is, what is R P Q? What is the location of R written in terms of what we know? It is, well, it looks like it's an amount R in the direction B1. So let's just draw the vector. This is what we're talking about right now. I will label this R P Q. And it looks like it's just R scalar r in the b1 direction. So this is r b1. Now the fact that we've written it in terms of the b frame makes taking this derivative particularly easy. What is the time rate of change of this vector but with respect to the b frame? So as if I was on the bar, what will I see? Well, I'll only see uh, growth in the b1 direction. So take the time derivative of this, and it is the time derivative r b1. So that means time derivative, we drop the, we're taking derivatives of scalars, it doesn't matter what the frame is. So we get rid of that subscript. This is time derivative of r in the b1 direction, plus if we were, you know, being really careful, what's the time derivative of the B1 dir direction with respect to the B frame? Well, this is zero. This will just use the shorthand notation R dot. So the time rate of change of this vector is R dot B1. Okay. And you know the reason we're using this is because like, we're building up to writing the transport equation, but this is the first step. Okay. Um, let's see, I wrote this as the I frame, but I think the problem is calling this the capital E frame. Um, if you wanna be careful, what's the E frame? It's, Got the origin O and then triad of unit vectors, E1, E2, E3. Okay, so part B says that same vector, what's its time derivative with respect to the E frame? So using notation that we use uh, the R vector, this is what we're asking, time derivative with respect to the E-frame of RPQ. And so we're going, okay, this relates to frames. We're going to have to use the transport equation. So it'll be the time derivative of RPQ as seen in the B-frame plus the angular velocity of the B-frame with respect to the E-frame cross the vector r, p, q. And now what we're left to find out is, uh, and so that, that is the transport equation. We got to find out what is this thing? What is the angular velocity of the E frame with respect to the B frame? So this is, I think this is the trickiest part. What is that? Well, we can write, um, let's put the two frames side by side and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll write that out. So we've got the, we've got E3, E2, E1. Now imagine the two frames are aligned initially. So we've got our B frame, and the E frame aligned 
to go to the current configuration where we've got, uh, and if they were aligned, that would mean theta and phi equals zero. So if theta and phi equals zero, the, let's say the B unit vectors are aligned with the E unit vectors. B1 and E1 would be in the same direction. Uh, B2 and E2 would be in the same direction and B3 and E3 would be in the same direction if these two angles were equal to zero. Okay, now let's imagine um, the angles are not equal to zero. What would we have? Well, if we, and maybe I'll just draw it down here. Uh, let's do, you know, a rotation um, in phi. So if phi increased a little bit, but say to still stayed zero, we would have the B3 and E3 directions being the same, but B2 will come out a little bit, right? Rotate this way. Sorry, B1 will rotate and B2 will rotate. And what will we get? Let me sketch, try to keep these colors clear. So right now we're actually laying the foundation for carefully doing 3D rigid body rotations. Um, all right, so they, that rotation doesn't change the B3 direction, but it does, right, this is, I need to move this up a little bit. This is B. So now B1 is here. B2 is here. That's V. So doing this leads to the angular velocity that causes that is, uh, is there's theta dot, sorry, phi dot is the magnitude and it's in the direction of either E3 or B3. It's, it's you know, E3. So that's the first part of the angular velocity. Okay, now B2 is in a new direction uh, compared to E2, this should be E2. So now imagine theta increasing. As theta increases, that means we're, our axis is B1, it's like pivoting about E1, and B2 and E3 will both tip down. Um, so let's write that here, rotation in theta. We've got our E3 direction, E2 direction, and let's just look in the E2, E3 frame. So coming out of the screen is E, is actually B, B1 or something, yeah. If we look in this direction, uh, we've got B3 over here because it's been rotated by theta. So what angular velocity describes this? It's theta dot, um, am I doing this right? I think I'm not doing this right. We've got B, B2. This is the B. Rotating about B2. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, rotating about B2. So this is theta dot, I'll use the right hand rule, as theta, I'll curl my fingers in the direction the theta is increasing and my thumb gives the axis. So as theta increases, my thumb is pointing in the B2 direction. That's how I figure it out. So then combining these, the angular velocity of B with respect to E is phi dot E3 plus 
theta dot b2. And maybe it bothers you that I've combined unit vectors from the two frames, but shouldn't bother you. It's okay. If I wanted to write this completely in terms of one frame or the other, I could do that. I could write what is E3 in terms of the B frame. Um, so here's E3 and here's B3. This has uh, the angle theta and then here is B1. Angle theta. So E3 equals cosine theta B3 minus sine theta B1. And then I could write this angular velocity completely in terms of B frame components. And it will be minus theta dot sorry, phi dot sine theta B1 plus theta dot B2 plus phi dot cosine theta B3. So this would be the angular velocity written completely in B frame components. And notice I rearrange things. So I put the B1 component first, then B2, then B3. Because then if, if I wanted to, I could write this as a, a column vector, which becomes useful for taking cross products. But for now, I'll just leave it this way. Okay, let me recall what the, what we're doing this for. We're doing this to figure out the transport equation to write time derivative of RPQ with respect to the E-frame, and we've got to write, we already know this part, oops, I didn't want to do that. We already know this part because it's up here. Now we've got to do this second part that's due to just rotation of the B-frame with respect to the E-frame. So let's write that out. Cross R, P, Q, what was RPQ? RPQ, let me just sneak up up here, is RB1. So notice it's got only, it's only one component in the B-frame, the B1 component. And so I know the property of cross products that anything in the B1 direction cross anything else in the B1 direction is zero. So that part of the cross product will go away. And then we'll be left with uh, theta dot r, um, or let me put, yeah, theta dot r b2 cross b1 plus phi dot cosine theta r b3 cross b1. And now we use the right hand rule, maybe just sort of sketch what the B frame. The B frame is a right handed coordinate system. So B2 cross B1 is in the negative B3 direction. B3 cross B1, my thumb's pointing in the B2 direction. So what is this? This is, it's, I, I like putting the R first. So this is R phi dot cosine theta B2 minus R theta dot B3. So now I've got that and I could put it into the transport equation up here and I'll have that derivative.
And I like to group things in terms of uh, get them in the proper order of the B1 component, B2, and B3. So putting these in the proper order, it's R dot B1 plus R phi dot cosine theta B2 minus R theta dot B3. <clears throat> and now we're asked uh, part C is what is the derivative with respect to the E frame of R P with respect to O. You know, maybe that's the thing that we wanted all along. Let me go back up here to what the diagram is. So here's O, here's point P. We want this the time rate of change with respect to the E frame, which is probably an inertial frame. RPO. We've got RPQ, and then there's this other part that we have to worry about. This is RQ uh, with respect to O. So RPO equals RQO plus RPQ, right? In terms of to go from O to P, we could also go from O to Q and then from Q to P. And what is R? Q O. This is just equal to H in the E3 direction. Okay, so let me go back down here. This is what we want. And let's just remind ourselves R P O equals R Q with respect to O plus R P with respect to Q. This thing is just H in the E3 direction. And this, well, we know what that is. It's R, B, one. So if we now take the derivative, this is equal to the inertial derivative, sorry, derivative with respect to the E frame of R, Q, O plus R, P, Q. Derivative with respect to the E frame of R, Q O plus derivative with respect to the E frame of R P Q. But this R P Q, well, good thing we already solved that in part B. That was kind of the major headache. Uh, this other thing is not really a major headache. This is just derivative with respect to the E frame of H E3. Now, since that E3 direction doesn't change with respect to the E frame. This is just H dot E3. And if we, part of the question is express all of your answers completely in B frame components. So again, fortunately up above we wrote E3, here it is, E3 in terms of the B frame. So we could do the same thing here. So this is H dot uh, cosine theta B3 minus H dot sine theta B1. And then just collect all of our terms. So we do the B frame B1 components first, which gives us R dot minus H dot sine theta B1 plus what's the B2 component? B2 component doesn't change. And then what's the last component? There's R theta dot plus H dot cosine theta B3. And that's it. Um, so hopefully breaking it down by steps. This is a complicated looking situation, but if you break it down by steps, you can, you can do it. 
So that's one of the 3D problems. Right, what about the other 3D problem? Uh, okay. One, three. This is the one with a disc looking thing and a, something flying through the air. And my goodness, it's just too much. Let's see, do I even have it here? Maybe I had it over here? No. Okay. Well, I don't have a picture of it, so we'll just save that for later. That's left as your, uh, left as an exercise. Now, so I, I can sketch it. It is a, there's this weird post thing. Um, and then we've got something else coming out of it. And there's a disc. <laughs> and the disc, there's like a point P on this disc. And there's multiple frames you're given uh, you're told, okay, there's a frame attached to this kind of central post, and it's it's the inertial frame. N1, N2, N3. That's our inertial frame. You're also told there's an, an E frame, which is attached to the horizontal post that's moving around. And the way it's drawn in the uh, picture might be confusing to you if you just kind of view it as drawn at some intermediate location. So here's ER points along that horizontal bar. And then there's the E3 direction, which is the same as N3. And uh, there is the third direction, which is the direction that increases in the direction that uh, the angle phi is increasing. So this is E sub phi. So think of this as the horizontal bar frame. To actually do the problem, I think it's also good to, here's your point P. Think of a frame that is has its a unit vector pointed towards P and maybe we call this SR. And also there's one coming out of the uh, it's in the same direction as ER. And then there is a vector that's increasing in the direction that theta is increasing. So it's, it's hard to draw here. Um, but there is that there's some direction that's increasing in that direction. I don't know what it is. Uh, Something like that. The, uh, let's call it S theta. So even though the problem only mentions two frames, because we have kind of three rigid bodies, we've got the central shaft, which isn't moving. We've got the horizontal thing that's moving around, which is moving. So attach a frame to that. And then we have the disc. So attach a frame to the disc. Okay. And that's what this last thing is. This kind of S frame is attached to the disc. Um, so then try part A, okay? And, see, and you're, you're given the answers at the bottom of that homework. So uh, that homework problem three, so try it. And part B should be very easy. So if you're thinking too hard, don't. The missile is moving at a constant velocity just say that. And uh, it says it's moving at a constant velocity. All right. So try that out. So we got 20 minutes or so left. I wanted to do a demo of MATLAB. Some of you have used MATLAB, maybe some of you haven't. But you will need to use something not necessarily MATLAB, but uh, I like using MATLAB. And the book gives a lot of its, when it does sort of tutorials or examples, it says, you know, here's two lines of MATLAB. 
you know, enter it in MATLAB and you'll see the same results. Plus they have a, in the back of the book, they have something about how to solve ordinary differential equations using MATLAB. So I'm gonna do a MATLAB demo. And this is for, this is basically solving uh, ODEs and visualizing the results. And the book in Appendix C.5 talks about that. I'll be looking at the example from tutorial 3.2, which is on page 94, Kasdan and Paley. This is a mass sliding uh, on a parabola. So I, I just think of a, a, a hockey puck in a half pipe. All right, here's, a, here's our mass. And if this is you know, completely slick or we cover it in bear grease or something, um, you've got the hockey puck moving that way and it'll just sort of slide back and forth. So let's solve for the motion. And that has, has the shape of a parabola. Which I don't think a half pipe is an actual parabola, right? It's got semicircular, but it's easier to code up a parabola. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So the situation, um, if I were to draw a diagram of our parabola, this isn't a perfect parabola, but you get the idea. There's our uh, parabola-ish thing. Gravity is going down. I've got a particle, oops, here, just some arbitrary location. Here's where our particle is. Um, it's you know it's got a mass m. It's convenient to use the bottom of the parabola as our origin. So I'll call that point O. And then we'll want to write what is the position of p with respect to O. That's the first step. And then we'll take two inertial derivatives of it. The uh, instead of using N1 and N2 as the inertial frame components. The book describes this as, uh, you know, it says this is the X direction. So let's call this E sub X. And then here's E sub Y, it's the Y direction. And that's what it calls the, the inertial frame. That's fine. Need to be flexible with what you use for notation. So that is, we're just work, working in a 2D world, so that's the inertial frame. Uh, what about the parabola? The parabola, I don't know why I put a Y at the end of the parabola. Parabola has a shape. If we were to use Cartesian coordinates, right, this is Y. Um, as a function of x equals mu x squared. So mu can vary, right? If mu is really large, we've got a very steep parabola. If mu is very small, we've got a very wide parabola. All right. And since the motion of the particle is constrained to be on this parabola. Parabola. We really only have one degree of freedom and you could view that one degree of freedom as either kind of arc length along the parabola or it's convenient to use X as our one degree of freedom. we'll use X and you'll be like, well, what does that mean? That means if I wanted to specify where the point P is, I would say it's, it's, a, it's like a parameterized curve X and then Y of X, or if you want X and then mu X squared 
tells me exactly where the particle is on that on that parabola. So it's we have a the particle can be anywhere on that curve parameterized by one number, which is x. So if we were to write the position of the particle, in general, we would use, we would write X and Y because we would think, well, this is two degrees of freedom. So we'd say this equals X, EX plus Y, Y component in the EY direction. But instead, we know how Y depends on X. So this is X, EX plus mu X squared, EY. All right, and we're just gonna directly substitute in right there. Now, when we start taking derivatives, what will we get? So the inertial velocity is the inertial derivative of this vector. The only thing that can change is x. So we've got x dot in the ex direction plus two mu x, right? We're just taking the derivative of this with respect to time. So we use the uh, rules of differentiation. Two mu x, x dot ey. We take another inertial derivative and uh, what will we get? X double dot ex plus for the second thing we'll get two mu x dot squared plus x double dot in the ey direction. And then we, this is the inertial acceleration. So this is what will go into Newton's law. The mass times the inertial acceleration equals the total force on the particle. So let's give some thought to what's happening. I kind of like to think of, all right, let's, what's happening right here? We'll do a, th a three body diagram for what's happening right there, where the particle is. Here is our particle, P. We've got our, I'm just kind of locally showing the parabola. We definitely have the force due to gravity pulling this down. So that would be mg in the negative ey direction. And then we have the normal force. So we'll write this as n and we'll call this direction that's locally normal to the parabola as en. So this is n en. And we could work out what En is if we, if we wanted to. Later on in the course, we'll be referring to something like this normal force as a force of constraint. It's like forcing the mass to stay on the parabola and not fly away. In fact, it might not even be going in the direction I'm showing, right? It might be going, maybe it points in the negative En direction, but all we care about right now is just doing correct bookkeeping of all of the applied forces on the particle. So we've got N, the EN direction minus MGEY. Okay. So what do we get here? This will be uh, NEN minus MGEY. Um, since I'm short on time, I'm going to skip some steps, but you can look in the tutorial. So, so look in tutorial for how do we eliminate the normal force. And then we will get uh, an equation for x double dot. 
where x double dot equals negative two mu x g plus two mu x dot squared divided by one plus four mu squared x squared. So I'll leave it to you as an exercise to figure out how we got to this point. My main goal right now is just once you've got an ODE like this, and this is a nonlinear ordinary differential equation, uh, I don't think it's possible to solve analytically. Maybe it is, but we want to solve this second order ODE for x as a function of time given some initial conditions. Okay. So we want to solve this second order ODE for x as a function of time. given some initial conditions. And we'll say that the initial time is zero. So initial conditions will be the initial x position at zero and the initial x velocity at zero. If you wanna simplify life, let's just say we're releasing this at rest. So we've got the marble or mass on the parabola. We let go and we know that it's just gonna kind of go back and forth. There's no friction. If we included friction, there'd be an extra force in here, like a, along the parabola that's resisting motion, but we don't, we don't have that. So let's leave that for later. And then if we get, if we get X as a function of time, we could, you know, plot, x um, versus time or x dot versus time. Maybe we even want to do an animation of what this thing will actually look like. What will the motion look like? So we could do x and y, some kind of animation where we know that y is mu x squared. And coding this in uh, MATLAB isn't, isn't hard. Okay, so I think I introduced it last time. How do you go from a second order ODE to first order ODE? So uh, MATLAB is mostly set up to solve first order ODEs, but then you've got, you've got this situation. Um, I'll just remind you here to look at appendix, all of appendix C, but specifically appendix C.5 on some beginner tips. for using MATLAB. Um, and especially the numerical, the main numerical integrator that is fine for this course. A numerical integ integrator basically solves a nonlinear ODE. Usually they're pretty good. ODE 45. It means a fourth and fifth order runga cut a scheme. And if you wanna know how do numerical integrators work, you could also look in Appendix C. It gives you some idea of how they work. So we first, to turn the second order ODE into two first order ODEs, we introduce, like there's no need for calling it Z, but let's just call it Z. Some Z1 equals X, and then Z2 equals X dot. Then our first order ODE system of equations is uh, Z1 dot equals Z2, right? So we're, we're using, using Z1 and Z2 as our variables now. That's uh, what we've got going on. Z2 dot equals we basically are just rewriting what we have up above, minus two mu Z1 times G plus two mu. Now we've got X dot, which is, what is X dot? Z2 squared 
divided by one plus four mu squared Z one squared. Um, the way that MATLAB works, you deal with like Z is a going to be some kind of two by or a two dimensional column vector. So Z one and Z two are its components. That's why it's called MATLAB. It deals with matrices. So then we can code this up with uh, some initial conditions. We're gonna say that the initial velocity is zero and I don't know, so we'll pick some initial position that's on the right side. So maybe machine one equals one, one meter. And then we'll release and see what happens. So hold on, I think I made a mistake up here. There should be another right there. I missed a X. Okay. Um, everything else is consistent. I just forgot to put that. So happens. So I'm going to switch from looking at this notebook here to, if I can figure it out, showing my own screen. So how do I, I want to not share my screen anymore. Well, I'll just do this. What am I looking at? My entire desktop. Okay. All right. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. I think you can. This is MATLAB and I will provide this code and you can adapt it to like the problem for the skydiver problem or any other problems you have. So this is my MATLAB code. Um, you could look at what the, this is me taking what I wrote on paper and just turning it into MATLAB style code. So you, you first define a function and you call it like z dot equals and you name it whatever you want. So this is my ODE fun because it's fun. No, because it's a function. And I think the first term must always be t. The second must always be the variable z. And then you could pass parameters. So here we're passing uh, g. You know, maybe we want to simulate g on the earth, 9.8, or g on the moon, you know, and then mu. And then uh, I've just written what z, z dot one one is just the same as z one dot, and it equals z two, and then z dot two one is the same as z two dot written analytically, and then you you know write it using the syntax of MATLAB. Um, I often use kind of my main script. I call it Run Me, so I can remember what do I run? Run me. Um, so here we've set what G is, mu, I'm just setting equal to one, and then the mass is one, an initial time of zero, a final time of 10. I'm also uh, doing a time step for the output, which is every hundredth of a second. So then you define this thing called T-span, uh, written initial conditions. So like I said, the initial velocity will be zero, and the initial position will be one. So x equals one means it'll be up to the right. And then this is the main you know, business part of it. Uh, this is the syntax for simulating the ODE over that time scale that you want. And then this will plot x and x dot versus time. So let me just run this. Uh, you can either run it from here, or if you're in the correct, if you're in the correct um, directory, you just type "run me," and voila, there it is. There's a plot. So how do we interpret this? So this is writing the solid line is x is a function of time, and you see it's sinusoidal, and then the dashed line is the velocity. And I look at this and. Uh, Okay, it looks like a bunch of curves. It's a lot easier if you could kind of visualize what does the motion really look like. So I have written something called animate. I don't know if it's worth looking at the guts of it, but it plots, say, z1 and then mu times z1. Um, 
as time goes on. So you'll you get to see a little movie. So let me, you know, typing figure opens up a new figure, and then I will. Let me make this a little bit bigger. You first have to run run me so it has that data stored. If you don't know how MATLAB works, it stores variables. And you could type who to find out who they are, who's to find out how big they are. So I've got a variable Z, which is 1001 by two. That's all my data of Z1, Z2 at each of the time steps. So I've, I've already done that. And the animation, so I, I have a, script called animation that's why i'm writing it and if i do that you can see um we get to kind of visualize what is the motion doing so we release this thing from red it's it moves pretty slow um but it does qualitatively what we expect right it re released from rest it's going back and forth it's moving the fastest as it goes through that bottom part and it's just going back and forth to me, this is more informative than seeing um, those mind-numbing plots. But oh, hey, I moved something, and now it's freaking out. Um, but you know, whatever, whatever works for you. So that is my MATLAB example.